So next we have a talk on the block is uh, Hari Shankar. Hari Shankar is a CEO at uh, Red Panther Software Solutions. Uh, he has been building a SaaS applications and the APIs using the uh, Ruby and Rails and the Postgres. So today his talk he's going to share his experience and uh, he will let you know the tips and tricks of how you can make your existing application faster. Uh, basically to optimize the database in PostgreSQL. So please welcome Hari Shankar. Good morning. Cool. So good morning guys. I'm going to talk about databases. Uh, before I start, can I have a show of hands? Like, how many of you are database admins? Oh, we work exclusively for the database? Okay, uh, any web developers? Awesome. So, for the database admin, uh, I'm a web programmer. So, basically, I'm the guy who you blame when your database starts crashing or it creates problem. <laughs> and for the Web developers, guys, we need to care about the databases because uh, that's where the entire business is. Because how we sell the data, how we manipulate the data, that's literally how we make money. So a fun fact about this talk is that I had to run three kilometers to reach the talk on time, thanks to Bangalore traffic, OK? And I think I did my best time today. So my name is Hari Shankar. Uh, everywhere in the web, I'm known as CodeRatchers. And I write a Ruby code for a living. Uh, one thing that you notice about me is that I love stickers. So I love collecting stickers at every conference that I go to. So if you guys have stickers, please uh, give to me. And if you guys want stickers, I have Red Panther stickers. So meet me after the talk. <laughs> Yes, I work at Red Panthers. We are a Ruby on Rails dev shop. We work exclusively in Ruby, uh, specializing in Rails, and Postgres is our backend. And we are from Kochi. Anyone from Kochi, Kerala? Oh, yes, cool. So, uh, actually, this talk is actually a story. So, I'm going to tell you a story of a novice developer who wrote the first lines of code for a web app that was meant to process really small data, and that it so, grew so big that it was processing gigabytes of data every hour. It was an IoT application, and when we started out as a simple inventory software, I didn't know that this was going to grow like this. And the one thing that's good about being the first guy to write the code is that you can mess up the code so bad, and still the client can't fire you because you messed up it so much that only you can fix it. So this talk is how I fixed it, and how Postgres School was the single main tool that helped me grow my application, processing gigabytes of data, and now it's on the cloud, uh, providing service to over 40,000 stores, and almost 200,000 users. I'm, I'm not sure, because it's still growing. <laughs> so yes. This was me two years ago, crying for help, uh, because my client says we want to grow. So before I tell, let me talk about the tools that I use. So in my universe, this is my tools. Avengers. So Ruby is my Captain America. Rails is my Iron Man. And Postgres is the Hulk. <laughs> Who else would it be? I mean, it's a Hulk. The problem with web application developers, like most of you guys in the room, is that Hulk can smash anything, but we make him carry our suitcases. You know, it's like it's like he can like smash mountains, like build an entire like he can defeat uh, any enemies, and we are just using it to carry just our files. You know, nothing else. So this talk, we are going to make the database do all the stuff. Offload a lot of the things that we use Ruby and Rails to do, which is not supposed to be done by these guys, because Postgres is a Hulk, and he can do a lot of things. I'm going to show you that. And we have a Hulk. We shouldn't be scared to use it. 
No. When I talk to like web developers, most of the guys don't see this data part other than update and insert, that's it. That's the SQL that we write. So today I'm going to talk about query planner, indexing, attribute preloading, materialized views, generating JSON, and synchronous commits. So let's start with the query planner. Query planner uh, is like a brain. As you know, the database is general purpose, right? You don't build a database just for the web. When you build a database, you build for something that's meant to just store data and read once in a while, something to log stuff, something to uh, have rapid inserts. No, you can't build a database for everything. So you need to like, I'm sorry. Oh, oops. Not built for a single industry. So then how does it handle all the scenarios? The truth is it doesn't. That's what I learned. Like my database, I wanted to do a lot of things. I wanted to make it faster, but I found that database is not uh, built for all the scenarios. So what we do is we nudge it, we tweak it, we manipulate it so that it does what we want. And to do that, uh, we should know how the database works, all right? So the one thing that I learned is a SQL syntax uh, basically just give the information how I want the data. It doesn't give me anything how I want the data to be fetched. That was a revelation for me, you know. So far we have been using this and we never told the database how I wanted the data. It just, I told them how it should look like, that it should have the name, it should have the email, but how is it going to get it? That's entirely up to the database. But when we program in Ruby or Python, we let loose use of a lot of algorithms. We use, use a lot of things. Why aren't we using it in the database? So that's what Query Planner does. It's the brain of your database. We need to understand how it works to improve the system. So that's where my tweaking starts. A query planner is created by the database before every query is run, right? So the problem is the database thinks that it has the perfect plan. It thinks that there is no other perfect scenarios. That plan that it has is perfect. The truth is we know that it isn't, okay? so. So, need, we, uh, so for that, we need to see what the query planner does. I forgot to mention that since I came from Ruby, there's going to be a bit of Ruby code, but no need to feel afraid. I'll explain it. But uh, so this is what I did. So I had two tables in which I was searching for two things, and I found that on the first one, when I did the explain, okay. It plays, explain, it gives me the uh, query there. I, I, say, I could see that the first one was working on an index and the second one was a sequential scan. Okay, so that itself slowed down uh, my system. So that shouldn't slow down. So how do we make it fast? So that's what we're gonna talk about. So we check the query plan, find out where we are slowing down and then we start to nudge it. We start to change things. And we need to make the plan, choose the faster method, okay? We give them the, all the environment, all the information, all the uh, required procedures so that it will choose the right plan for us. And uh, no need to worry, I have done all of this in production, so you don't have to worry that it will uh, crash your system. Uh, a tip for those people who want, who doesn't like to read the plan, we have, we can make the plan, we can print the plan in any format they want. YAML is my favorite format. So, so this is the first thing, indexing. Yes. Let's not index everything. Okay, I learned it. Uh, and a painful step, I learned that we can't index everything. So index is a special lookup table that database creates so that it can search the tables faster. And index is like a pointer uh, to the table. Uh, 
where the fields are in order. So no matter how crazily you enter the data, the index properly orders them and gives you a pointer. Uh, but you know something? Databases are smart, really smart. So even if you have index, if it finds a sequence scan is faster, it will still go back to a sequence scan. So a use case that I saw this is was a column I had 10,000 rows. And it had a column in which only three values were ever there, which was short, medium, and tall. I found that no matter how much I index, unless I tell it to not do a sequential scan, it was going to a sequential scan. And the funny thing is, that was faster. Because it was so disordered, it didn't make sense for the database to do it. So our database is still smart. That's because of the query planner, it's estimating. It's estimating the cost. You know. And also uh, several factors like where the data was could have also been a uh, consideration, but I made sure that nothing was there in the cache. I just wanted to see like of a raw system how it was. So database is smart. So even if you goof up, even if you make mistakes, your database is smart. So what should we index? So we should index all the primary keys. We should index all the foreign keys. All columns you are passing to the where clause need to be indexed. Assuming that it's not like the case before, in which you only had three things that you want to search for. But if they're like lots, okay, say age, or the name, if you're going to do a search on that a lot, then index it. Uh, if you're joining tables using anything else other than the foreign key, index that thing. So I had a case in which we were decoding the IP addresses and using that to join. So we needed that. And a date range, if you are particular about your reports, then please index that. And there's something called scopes in Rails, in which we create a pseudo smaller tables from a bigger table, in which to make that faster, we use partial indexes. Partial indexes basically, instead of indexing the column, you can give it a condition saying that index anything that's greater than 10. Just an example. And do not index, okay? Do not index tables in which you have a lot of read write. It comes when you're working with IoT applications, you're going to have one table with a lot of raw data. You should not go and index it. Because the insert that I, want, I was talking about is like almost 100 megabytes a minute. If you're going to index that, you're just going to make your database admin really mad. Okay? Because it's going to spike in CPU every single Yes? What if I have a primary key to that particular table? Uh, but in, if, even if in that case, I would say if you have a lot of read writes, I'm not sure. I guess it belongs to the use case because. I can't think of having a lot of read writes and the primary key. Uh, but if you do, and if you are joining it, then yes. The only thing that I can think of is make it concurrently so that it doesn't mess up your updates. And if you have such an instance, I would say like increasing the hardware also would become. But uh, the stable that I'm talking about, I'm not sure if you have, if you are getting like 100 megabytes of data and you still want to index. Okay, what we did is we summarized the data. We had another process, a, a SQL query that's summarizing all the data and updating the main table. So there we had all the index. Okay. Um, but yes. And do not index tables that you know is going to be really, really small. Okay. So if you have a configuration in your tables and if you know it's going to be really small, then do not burden, the, uh, burden it with an extra index. And do not index the values if you're going to manipulate it a lot. Okay, if the value of this column is going to change at rapid pace, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I would need. So we have the same case. So we have eight readers in a store inserting data to our application. But the data that's being inserted for us is a ping. That it just says that I saw this, I saw this, I saw this, that's it. In which that's basically raw data. It doesn't make sense unless we process it. So what we do is we have a second table 
which process all this raw data and updates that with the last seen. Uh, this item was last seen by this reader at this time. So that's what actually makes sense. So if you have uh, like a network device, I assume that they are raw data. So I would say you have to summarize it periodically so that you just move to another data where the actual process start. Because if this table has a lot of read write, it's also going to slow down your querying. And also you can't be that sure that the data that you get from this table is always accurate. Because you are always getting data, right? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. So in those cases, the index really helps because we have a lot of data. Okay. So you are still doing it on the main table itself. This where the actual read write comes. I can't think of that thing being really fast because this table can grow in gigabytes of size. If yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, so, so your data is getting slowed down, right? It's being reduced. So in that case, we can do it. Because your table is not like growing every time. You are partitioning and making it smaller as well, which makes sense, OK? Which makes sense to do that. Uh, but if you're like piping in a lot of data, then it doesn't make sense. Unless you want to process on that table itself, which I would recommend like if you just move it out itself, you should be getting better performance. And yeah, if the column is, yes. So, uh, you're saying, so what does the manipulating mean? Because just insert or because the case of updated reads, index is actually done. They usually come the last step. You're seeing the, the column? The last point? Yeah, the last point. Okay. No, it's a manipulating in the sense like we had this count that was increasing, let's say, page views. Okay, that's changing like every time like we had a store in which the API request was sky high. Okay, we were getting like a million requests from this store alone a day. Okay, indexing, we did index that field, it just bloated for no reason. Okay, which in the in, uh, real sense, it has to, we don't have to do that. So here, uh, when I say manipulating, I won't say that if you're changing it every hour. I would say that if you're changing it like every second or every 10 seconds, then it's, you shouldn't do that. Because you are going to build index, which we know it's going to be, it's not going to be valid after 10 seconds. But say if you're like in one hour or one day, then it's fine. I mean, it's just milliseconds, yes. So, you know, the application, you update the data that comes, uh, that data you insert? Yeah. Will you update it? No, we just insert it to a raw data. Okay, <laughs> then we have another process that pro uh, summarizes it, and then we update the rest of the tables. No, they don't. Because it's. Kind of a blogging. Yes, yes. It's like all the devices are just writing data, just giving me the information. And it's my application that makes sense out of this data. Okay? Now, this is for web application developers. Uh, that's attribute preloading. So, it's a good use of Postgres array. In the Rails way, uh, if we had a task table uh, and it had tags, what we did is we included the task and tags, uh, which actually fired two SQL queries. In uh, Rails, every row is an object, so we ended up creating more objects, which takes more memory, which is not good. Okay, if you are working on a limited RAM system, it's not good at all. So uh, this was the query that gets run. So we fixed this using Postgres arrays in which we preloaded the data as an array. OK, it uh, sends a single SQL query. And it makes from this step to this step three times faster. So getting all our data in a single request uh, speeds up our application. So towards the end, I'll show how, how I'm doing this with JSON as well. But attribute preloading is a really uh, easy way to improve your system. Now this is materialized view. Now we use this a lot to help our reporting tool, etc. 
So the thing about materialized view uh, is that it's database view, but the data is stored. So those of you who are not clear what a view is, so let's say you have multiple tables. Let's say users table, then the company table, and the employee table. And you have a web page in which you are showing all these three information. And to do that, what you're actually doing is you're querying it. You're getting the user. From there, you're getting the company. Okay? And through the company, you're going to the employee records. So we are actually loading all these three. So that kind of complicates our query. The way, so if you want to like nest this query into another query, okay, you're just building up the, your queries. Okay? So what we do is we create a view so that we can call this complicated query in a single statement. So that's what view is. And in design patterns, when you say model view controller, uh, the view comprises a lot of models. So it's the same design pattern that's used there. So we are going to like combine a lot of views, I'm sorry, a lot of queries to create a view. So all this can be combined and be called as employee detail table. Now the thing about views is that this thing, uh, yeah, so this is an example. One manages, you create a view. So it's like in a company's table, you have something called managers. You do where equals managers. You can create a simple view that calls this as company managers. So next time you just do select star company managers, you get all the users who are managers, whose role is managers. This is a simple example. Yes? Uh, not quite sure. Can you just expand what? Yeah. Whenever, let's say you are going to operate an employee table. Yeah. And you created a view of companies. And whenever you are doing any operation on the employee, in order to reflect in the view that story. No, no, no. View, view doesn't store anything. It's just hiding your query. As soon as you make a change in that table, it will reflect on the view because you're not storing it everywhere. In the materialized view that I'm going to cover, yes, this will happen. Okay? So the thing is, uh, what we use materialized views to create reports for n minus one days. Okay, I have a report for the last n days. Okay, not including today. So my report for the previous day is not going to change. Okay, but my report for today is going to change. Okay, if I take an average of the last seven days, yes, it's going to be changed. But if I take the average of the weeks before that, it won't change. So we use materialized views when we know that we want something and it's not going to change. Okay, because it doesn't make sense that you're going to query every time again and again. And of course, you don't make materialized views for everything. You need to be particular where you're going to make it. Uh, yes? So, yes, I think we're jumping here. <laughs> so, the views, okay, uh, we do not create a physical table. Okay, so what Postgres does is an SQL is a single line. S, uh, Postgres break it, break, breaks it to a tree. Okay, and this tree is what actually gets you the data. So if you create a view, Postgres will have that, uh, that, ta uh, that tree ready for you. Okay, it doesn't have to do this conversion step. That's it. But that's not a performance boost. The only boost here is that you don't have to write complicated queries. Okay, so let's say you have, uh, like you're joining like five, six tables, okay, taking a data from all this and doing something. And then you find that you need to pass this query into another query, okay, a nested query. And you will drive yourself insane if you are doing this in a command line. Okay, but if you create a view for this, you just say uh, select star, comma, select star from company managers, okay? Else we, are, we would have to say select star comma select star from users where role equals managers. Okay, that's where the view part comes in. It simplifies the underlying data for you. But uh, now the schema of this new table it leaves in memory. Okay, the result is not stored, and the they're called pseudo tables. They don't exist. Okay, they're just in memory. But materialized view was first introduced by Oracle. 
and now found in postgraduate school, Microsoft, IBM, everything, except MySQL, bad MySQL. Uh, but they can do it with open source extensions. So uh, this, how can we use it in Ruby? So we are creating a view, a materialized view, and it will create an actual table in your hard disk. In your hard disk, it will be stored. And the thing about this is that uh, it's, uh, it's, so this is a use case in which I have the sales report. So the all time sales report. Okay, so the all time sales report is actually based on data minus today. Okay, when my clients or clients' clients comes and looks into the system, he wants to know how much money he made so far, right? He is looking at not today, n minus one. They are fine with that. And that gets loaded really fast. You don't have to actually process everything. Okay, and you get all the data as well. And also like this, we create the views for seven days, 14 days, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and 120 days. After that, they're fine with all time. So we have this, yes. Yeah, that's the thing, it's uh, static. You see, that's, that's when I told you like, uh, we know this data is going, not gonna change, right? Because the sales that happened seven days ago, it's not like someone is gonna invent a time machine and go back and make another sale, okay? So unless that happens, we are fine. But we need to update it at midnight of every day because new sets of entry just came in, right? So that's when we, do, we schedule a job to run at midnight when the stores are closed, no one is using our application, we just refresh it. The refresh in the sense the data, we just run this, we create this view again, okay? We can, uh, I think we found it faster to just drop it and create it again, yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. In 24/7, you can't. Yes. True. 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 So there's something that we actually did is in which case not for this application. Uh, there is like we can concurrently refresh it. That's there in the 9.5 of Postgres, I believe. It wasn't there before. Uh, 9.4 introduced materialized view. It wasn't there until. 9.3 or 4 or something is when the uh, uh, concurrent refresh came in. So before that, what we used to do is uh, we used to create another view and just copy stuff there so that it becomes online. But that's application side. Uh, it's our hack way to do it. So question from there, yes. Yeah. So f in our application, all time data takes like 10, 20 minutes actually, because we had a lot of data. We do, we did indexing, we did a lot of uh, our own site hacks to make it faster, but still we had a huge volume of data. Uh, so it took us that much time, but uh, it won't. It, it depends on the volume of data that you have. Yes, but if that's due, then I would say that you need to break it up. We need to like group this, find an average everywhere, and then merge it together. Are there any that No, actually, we end up writing uh, functions for this. So what we did is like we didn't want to offload all these things to the application. We implemented all as predefined methods in the database itself. So we found algorithms, we took something, we broke everything, we, you, like, we, all the mathematical cal calculation we offered to the database. Because we found that it's better that they were there than in our applications. Yes. So there is refresh concurrently, okay, in Metalize view. But as you said, if it takes a long time, it will take a long time, but it's still accessible. And so uh, you can index it here. 
you can create a primary key here. You can mention that this ID is the primary key of your materialized view. You can do everything with a regular table here except update. Okay, it, it's like a read-only database for you. So in a one million random sales record, which used to take us about one second to actually give us the data, uh, it went down to 2.3 seconds. Now this is the client actually viewing the sales report on the web page. Okay, so this was how the difference was. So, uh, what are the takeaways? It's faster to fetch data. Questions? Okay, I thought I saw a hand. Okay, it's faster to f fetch data. Uh, it captures commonly used joins and filters. Uh, it it's helps push us like a lot of data intensive purpose from Ruby to the database. Uh, it helps in fast live filtering because since we have the map view right there, on our front page we could just give them, yes, filter it. You know, because all the joins, we don't have to go through the joins again while sorting or ordering this stuff. And we can index it, okay? If you still want speed, index that as well. So the pain point is, like I found that it does use more RAM when we are refreshing it, and it does take physical space. So you will have multiple tables with the same data when you do this. Uh, it requires PostgreSQL 9.3 to do the mat view and 9.4 for the refresh concurrently, and it cannot cache live data. But if you are still crazy enough to do that, we can build our own tables and we can build our own views and just ask it right there. Okay, because we have done it. It's not a feature of Postgres because since we are developers and we have access to the code, we can do it. Now this is where uh, our app really speeded up. This is, if there's one thing that I'd like to, uh, all of you guys to learn from this talk would be this. And that's the JSON generation in database. So we, our, all, our, all our applications request API. Like nowadays, if there's a web application that doesn't have API, then be sure that application is not going to go anywhere. Okay? Or it's built for just a small set of users. So when our store application, it was literally meant for just one small store in Los Angeles, grew to 20, 40,000 stores, right? We had to integrate our application with a lot of point of sale services, uh, all the inventory systems, etc. So we needed to generate data, I mean the APIs, and it was huge. It was huge lots of data. So we need the JSON because uh, JSON is the glue of the modern day web applications. They connect everyone together. And so, Postgres made our, our life a lot easier because it started supporting JSON. It started supporting JSON natively that we can create the JSON from the database and the web application is nothing but an HTTP interface for your database. Before when you had to convert like hundreds, so this thing like this, you have the database, you run the SQL query, you get a data, it's serialized, okay, then we deserialize in the web application, then we serialize as JSON and we send it again. Okay, so this process just became repetition of what database did. So when database started to support JSON, I mean, the only reason I for a second thought about MongoDB was because of JSON, JavaScript. And then PostgreSQL came to my life and said, no, no, please don't go, I, I have JSON. <laughs> so this road to JSON just converts everything uh, in that table to uh, JSON, which is this big, and I'm not an idiot to display my passport. So. But this is bad. <laughs> I can't send this to the user. I mean, it has too much information. So then what we do is like we create our own structures, select ID, email from users, and then we convert that to JSON, and we send it. So that's it. The thing is like you are actually serializing the data again, okay? Uh, 
Rails input serializes are not using. So if you're using Rails, okay, you can use something called, I don't remember the name, but you can, there's a gem that uses C to serialize. If you're using Ruby to serialize, do not, don't do that, it's still gonna be slow. Slow in the sense that our web applications are fast for a use case. Okay, if I have a simple mobile app, okay, in which I have like 100,000 users, that's nothing. But if I have data crunching applications that depend on these APIs, that expects me to send the entire data over API, okay, then you need something faster. And also, the logic is that you, SQL actually does the serializing, okay, and you are going to deserialize and serialize it again. Okay. Yes, I'm going to that. Yes, because I know we have to get information from everywhere. What is the size? Oh, mine? A one store would be like eight gigabytes. And we use Amazon RDS and partitioning. And, but we also try to bring it down a lot. And the reporting services are the same? Sorry? No, we create uh, something like a read-only, so uh, from there, but basically it's the same data itself. We have one fail-safe backup as well. Other than that, we don't have nothing. And yes, I'm really bad at that. I need to fix it, yes. Sorry? Result? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so if you, if you, when, we are, when we are using this in Rails, it will return me a single object. Okay, so before if I had users.all and I had 1,000 users, I would have 1,000 objects. Now I have a single object in which there's an attribute which has a JSON. And I literally just read it and just pass it to my view which responds to JSON. Okay, that's the one thing I love about Ruby, it's object oriented. If it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So if you pass a string which looks like a JSON, Ruby will take care of it. Okay, so that's good. Uh, yes, more complex one, right? Because we, we uh, our clients make our life hell. They won't give us simple requirements, they will give us hard requirements, and this is how we do that. So then in these cases, I actually create methods because to make my life easier, oh, make this into a view, okay, to make our lives easier. So yes, you just need to like, uh, let's say if uh, email, so the user, which is me, have projects, right? I use the array to JSON method to get, uh, the, to make a row to JSON into an array, which have all the projects that I do. So this is how I build a complicated query. So array to JSON, row to JSON. So there are methods like this, but this is how we build complicated query. And if you want, and I really suggest use views here, okay? Like I told you, like if you want to pass a huge SQL query into another query, that's when you use views, okay? Because you